So thank you all so much for joining us on a Sunday morning. Um, it's really great to have folks and I'm so excited for the opportunity uh, to talk with Jarrett Adams about his new book, Redeeming Justice. Um, I hope that people have had a chance to read the book and if not, I hope that your, our conversation today um, encourages you to do so. Um, I will introduce Jarrett briefly, um, but I'm excited for him to tell you uh, his story himself. Jarrett was 17 years old when an all white jury sentenced him to prison uh, for a crime he didn't commit. And he has in the years since that happened just become an extraordinary advocate both for himself and for others. Um, after he was freed with the help of the Wisconsin Innocence Project, he went on to college, to law school, and now um, to running a growing law firm that is dedicated to helping people right wrongs after wrongful conviction. So welcome, Jarrett. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate being here. I hope that you can give folks um, on our webinar today uh, a brief um, a brief explanation or discussion of your book and your story and then um, we'll talk a little bit more about some some specifics and we'll answer some questions um, i'm really looking forward to having this opportunity to tell people uh, about your book and about your what you're up to these days yeah well thank you again and and the book is 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 the journey of you know my story um and 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 it's just it's one of these things where I can recall like when I when I first came home in February of 2007 and, you know, just trying to pick up the pieces and put my life back together. And it was difficult. I mean, I, it was it was, you know, you're talking about three kids is what we were three kids from Chicago who are accused of a sexual assault by a, a white um, accuser. And I, I didn't I know we were not expecting for when allegations didn't make sense and when you know you know you're telling the truth we didn't expect that that wasn't enough and and we had a rude awakening uh we didn't realize that it really came down to how much resources one had um and the type of lawyer that that me and my co-defendant dimitri had so it was so much going on with the three of us being charged uh, Dimitri never, you know, uh, De Ravon never spending a day in prison or being convicted. The severed trials, uh, me and Dimitri coming home differently. I come in, I come home off of behaviors. Dimitri misses a deadline. So it was so much going on, Kate, that I wanted to tell the story from a perspective of the ridiculousness that it is sometimes with these cases and how difficult it is. For, for someone to fight against this monster, this monstrosity that is the criminal justice system. So in writing the book, I told the perspective of, look at the effects that it has on one's family, the community, and look how the justice system is suffering as a whole, as a result of it. Well, I wanna, I, I think that's exactly right. And I hope that that's what people take away from this book. I wanna take you back a little bit to um, exactly what you were talking about, your family and your community. Uh, I know that um, you come from a tight-knit, loving family, uh, mm -hmm. but maybe for the folks who haven't had a chance to read the book yet, you can explain a little bit about your, your childhood and your family. Yeah, so I grew up on the south side of Chicago, born and raised, and, and it was this was in the 80s. So for people who aren't familiar with these neighborhoods, the 80s is... is around the, the war on drugs. It's around the time that crack cocaine is basically suffocating the community of the communities of color. And so it was one of these things where from the front porch, you could see the evolving of the neighborhood in a bad way. So my grandmother and grandfather, they came from down South Mississippi and they came with the spirit of family sticks together you know, ain't no such thing as them your kids. These are our kids. Everyone's going to be watching someone. Uh, so that's the type of family it was. So it was just like someone's always around and stuff like that. And, and this heartening thing was, I realized that, that when you get in contact with the criminal justice system, they paint a narrative of you 
as if you were born at the scene of your accusation. So that's the reason why I focused on my family and who I was as an upbringing, because I didn't want people to be confused and say, okay, well, well, those kids, and, and that's just what happens and stuff like that. So mom, aunts, you know, they were the people, you know, who, who raised me when my grandmother, who was the matriarch of the family, had passed away. And so it just, it was something else in that I was fortunate that I had that nucleus because Kate, that's how I was able to come home and reintegrate as successfully because I had that family. But a lot of people who go through what I've went through, they are the last leaf on their family tree by the time this is over. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, your story is extraordinary in many ways. And, and one way is this loving family who, who cared so much about you and stuck by you. And another way is your own resilience and resourcefulness. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Um, maybe you can give people some context for the, the case and kind of how it started. Yeah. So the, the, the case, I, I just kept saying to myself, this is going to be over with any minute right? Um, that's, that's the thing that I kept saying to myself, especially so because, you know, you, you had um, a mistrial declared. We had a total different narrative testified to that was different from what the police report was. And I mean, we were supposed to, to, to I encourage people to get the book because what I talk about would make sense once you read the book. But there was this narrative created and we were just dropped into it. And that's, that's the best that I can, I can say is that this historical depiction of the over-criminalization of black boys and, and, and if it's an accusation, it has to be true because why not? They're black, you know, that, that type of thing was going on and it was blatant um, in our case. And so we're accused of a sexual assault. The only thing is an accusation, however, the accusation doesn't make sense. And it never made sense, Kate, from the very beginning, including that the police knew very shortly after this false accusation, they had a witness statement who basically undermined the entire narrative of sneaking up a flight of stairs, walking our way into a room, and then we flee the building after a gang rape as if it was a scene from a movie. And it was just, it was just so ridiculous. And I kept saying to myself by any minute now you know all right where's the where's the who where are the pranks at you know where are the people coming out and it never happened until 10 years later and it was just so difficult and gut-wrenching to watch how it played out because co-defendant uh rovan charges dismissed we thought for sure that that would affect both me and my remaining co-defendant dimitri and it didn't and my mom and my aunts kept trying to understand and me with this limited high school, Chicago public school education, I'm trying to explain to them and they don't, none of us get it. So I went to the law library, Kate, and I didn't leave that place until I finally got it. And that, that fortitude, that tenacity, that Jared never give up, that came from watching how my mom and my aunts never gave up. And I said, if they can't, if they're not giving up, then who am I to stop fighting? Right, and it took you a little while to get there. You know, yeah. just for for folks who don't know, Jarrett and his friends, Ravon and Dimitri, were uh, kids who had graduated from college, and they went to a college party. They they um they went to a college party, and they they hooked up with another with a college student there, and that college student later accused them of a sexual assault. Um, there were you know you talk about this in the book. There was a um there was an, a witness who yeah. was never interviewed or called. Um, and there were other witnesses at this party who, who could have corroborated what you guys were, you, what you boys were saying that, yeah. you know, that this was that, you know, that, that you were hooking up with another student, but that, that, was, you, it. But that was it. Yeah. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, and we have an excerpt from the book that I'm going to ask yeah. you to read. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the way that, um, because I think this illustrates so well how different um, people with different resources and get different outcomes. And some of it was luck yeah. of the draw, right? And some of it was just 
Rovan's family had more resources. So I wonder maybe, do you wanna maybe give just a little bit of context for that before you yeah. um, read from this part of your book? Yeah. Right. So we're, we're, all, we're all charged and Rovan had family who stayed in, in Wisconsin. Um, and the family called down and was like, look, yeah, I know you guys don't know this, but Wisconsin locks up more black kids per capita than any other state. This is no joke. You, you guys got to do whatever you need to do to get an attorney. And, and it was one of these things, Kate, where all of our parents had the same thing, the same response. Oh, well, you know, they didn't do it, right? And it was like, it, we were the only ones in the room who didn't realize the truth didn't matter in situations like this, when you're accused and, when, and it's about what you can prove now. So now we're, we're, Two of us, me and Rovan, me and Dimitri, are assigned panel list attorneys off of a panel list. Um, when the public defender is conflicted out, if you can't afford an attorney, they appoint you an attorney off of a panel list of attorneys. And that's the who's who. You don't know who you're getting. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wheel. And so you're spinning and you don't know who you're getting. You don't know the qualifications. And you don't necessarily have a say so in the matter and who you choose, which is even more disheartening to think that there are people on a list appointed to represent people and there are no checks and balances. We would later find out that, you know, my attorney was like recently barred, didn't have any malpractice insurance, you know, and just wasn't qualified to take on the case. And so, you know, was the story for a lot of the, the, the qualification issues with, with, Demet with Dimitri's attorney. So now we go to trial where Boyle, Gerald Boyle is hired by Rovan's family. And Boyle was pretty much just leading the charge. He was asking all the questions, he was, he was impeaching, he was filing all the motions. So at a certain point we were declared a mistrial because of what the prosecution did. The prosecution didn't want to let the case go to the jury at the first trial because everything in the police report was not testified to. It was actually inaccurate and it was all over the place with the accusation. So it was then, Kate, where the fork in the road happened, right? Where we had no idea that Rovan's attorney was filing motions based on dismissing the charges in a case outright because of double jeopardy and things like that. Our attorneys didn't join in. And more importantly, they never, they never told us, Kate, until we made it to trial the day of. And that made us make a horrible decision that changed the trajectory of me and Dimitri's life forever. Yeah, yeah. So I hope that you'll read this brief passage from, um, from it starts on page 115 um, about the dismissal um, yeah. of the charges against Ravon, yeah. So this is page 115 through 116. The prosecutor dismisses all charges against Rovan. My friend goes home. He never spends a single night in prison. Boyle's excellent, expensive lawyering, and I like to think the three letters I write set Rovan free. I'm jubilant. This case is cut and dry. Rovan is walked soon. I am sure so will Dimitri and I, but we don't. The prosecutor doesn't dismiss the charges against us. He says that because our lawyers went for no defense strategy, and didn't call any witnesses, he doesn't feel that we should be given a new trial. Yeah. So I, I want to talk about two things related to that. So, so one is um, we hear all the time about, uh, you know, in, in the media and sort of colloquially about people getting off on a technicality. Yeah. Right. And this is like the opposite of that. Yeah. This, this is, you, you guys are kids who got sent to prison sort of because of right. these technicalities. It didn't have anything to do with whether or not you did something wrong. Yeah, um, this was, this was, yeah. you know, one of the things that I talk about in the book is this, and this happens a lot in, in criminal cases involving um, the accused being of color and the accuser um, being, being white or other, you know, for the most part. And so what happens is, there's a filling of the voids in the case where you know common sense would tell you otherwise. There's a filling of that with the narrative of 
well, well, why would why would she? Why would he? These with these black boys with these black, you know, and that thing continued out throughout like the entire trial, and it was it was it was just it was so so eye opening to realize that that was what they were doing, and, and the court was allowing it to be done, you know, um, you know, a prosecutor who has a discretion right then and there, and. And I and I and I focus on that for a second, and I say right then and there to do the right thing because, because, the discretion was all in the power of the prosecutor. He was the one who decided to dismiss the charges against Rovan. He didn't do this for nothing. He did this because the police officer withheld the the full statement, and he knew its impact on the jury. And so at that point, it was an opportunity to allow us to have at the very least a fair trial with the evidence of our innocence that the jury never heard. And the prosecutor used his discretion not to do it, not because he felt that we were guilty. He did it simply because he cared more about a victory. And that's a problem. And it's, and it's a problem that sweeps across our criminal justice system. That's right, yeah. So I I think um, that we we talk a lot about the inadequacy of your representation and how your lawyers went with a no defense strategy. Um, I mean, now you're a lawyer, right? You're seeing cases and defending cases and working on cases. Yeah. Have you seen that before where the lawyer took a no defense strategy? And, and what do you think about that? Yeah. So look, Kate, that was a, that was never a strategy. You know, that was ineptness, you know, and downright negligence um, and failing to do, do one's job. That's what that was about. And that was the excuse that was used Oh, well, no, we went with a no, def no defense theory. But to answer your question, absolutely. There's a problem with adequate representation. And the problem is, is, is systematic. And there are things that could be done to fix it, but they're just not simply being done because the totality of its, of its disproportionate effect is happening mainly to people of color. And what I mean to dig deeper in that is this. So you're talking about 70, if not 80, if not higher percent of folks accused of, of criminal crimes are, are in these impoverished areas are reliant on public defense. You're talking about a public defense system where on average lawyers, single public defenders are managing 40 to 70 cases uh, 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 at a time. Kate, if you and I did that in a private practice, we would be in front of the board of bar examiners explaining how in the heck could we be effective with that much of a caseload. So, you know, I look at that and I look and I say to myself that there are, there are it's designs and flaws in this system that is allowing and setting up unjust convictions, wrongful convictions, over sentencing, people pleading guilty. Can, you know how many times I've, I've come across people pleading guilty just because they want to get out of the county jail? Absolutely. Not because they're guilty. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think there's an additional wrinkle in, in the way that your case was handled that people might not understand if they're not, you know, they've never been system involved and they don't, um, you know, they don't really understand the ins and outs of how this works, but you were assigned a lawyer from a panel, mm -hmm. which means that a career public defender, a person who was employed by the public defender's office didn't handle your case. Yeah. Your case was handled by a private attorney who had agreed to accept some public defender cases. And I mean, until recently, um, it's so it's still bad in Wisconsin, but until recently, Wisconsin was the lowest, uh, had the lowest reimbursement rate for private attorneys. So they were getting paid $40 an hour um, to take these cases. And that might sound significant to people who have like, to get like a regular salary. But the truth is, that's, that's not enough to cover overhead. Plus, if you have clients who are paying a, your regular rate. If you're a lawyer who, have, who has clients who are paying your regular rate, then you know those people are going to take precedent. And absolutely, I, yeah. I just want people to understand that because, like, again, like there are plenty of panel attorneys who are great who, who do a really good job regardless of the low reimbursement rate because they feel passionate about justice and they want to make sure people get a fair trial. But you know, two uh, lots of other scholars have talked about how um, having a having a panel has its own set of problems, its own slew of problems. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of these things where, where Kate, the panel idea was necessary, it was needed. 
But the problem is the checks and balances now. You know, the problem is the lack of, the lack of resources. And Dan will write this. Why can't we have an equal fair system that allows resources and, and, and training and, re, and, and, and investigative, you know, resources and stuff like that on the public defense side, on the side where a person, why does it matter that if a person isn't able to afford, then that distance them from justice, it, it, it shouldn't be. I, I mean, and then to, to even revisit the situation about the prosecutor in, in my case, yeah. You're talking about someone who has the, the discretion and the authority. And if people believe, if people watching this believe that the prosecutor's job is solely to prosecute, you're wrong. It's not. It's to protect the, the community. It's to enforce the laws. And it's, it's, it's for justice, right? And that doesn't require someone to do nothing but prosecute. That requires someone to use the power that is that discretion to make the right decision. And, and, and it wasn't, it was horribly abused in our case. Yeah, it definitely sounds like it. Um, and, and certainly now looking back, we can see, you must've been able to see that at the time. How did that how did that feel to you as a kid? You know, you were very perceptive I, at that age, I think. I wasn't processing like like I am now. And who would expect me to, right? Or right. when I was a kid. I mean, Kate, literally, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about the chores that I needed to do, you know, once the trial was over, because I right. just was assured that it was going to be over and end in the fashion. You know, I, I don't, I've, I've, I've been able to take what pains me and turn it into a passion, you know, to help others. But make no mistakes about it, it's exhausting. You know what I mean? Like, like Dimitri came home three three months after I did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he didn't want to get into this field. And I can understand, you know, why, because it is exhausting. I just felt like I offered, you know, an insight on something that I that would be helpful to us all if we if we listen. Yeah, absolutely. This is a powerful message that you've you've crafted here. And I and I hope people um, get a chance to to really dig into it because it's it's so so important and I mean who better to explain it to people who've never been system involved than somebody who was wrongfully convicted and can tell you exactly about how it felt and what it was like um, after your conviction uh, you struggled and then ultimately and I don't know how much you want to talk about that but then ultimately you were able to get um you helped yourself a really significant amount and then you were also able to secure some help from the wisconsin innocence project um before we read about the outcome of that do you is there anything else you want to share with folks yeah i, I mean i, I want to make sure that that this doesn't go without being um said um my story is 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 amazing in that how i've been able to get to where where i am but um, it's also amazing that it took all of this to get to where I am, right? And I think that we're losing out on talent, on folks who can contribute to society. And I'm not here based all on myself, like the community invested in me and you know, I was given an opportunity. And so I took that opportunity and, and just worked my butt off, like is, is where I am. And so now the thing is, it's important to document how difficult it is. So that way it makes the road smoother for those coming behind. And Kate, you know, as the, as the work that we do with SIFS and, and the advancements of science and stuff like that, we see that we're still learning. We're still being corrected by the science. So we know people are gonna still continue to be, to be litigated out and, and we need to educate as many lawyers as possible in the courts and the judges and the prosecutors uh, and the experts themselves, right? Um, right. To make sure that we get this thing right. And I hope people understand, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if people understand how much chance goes into an exoneration because yeah. not to ever diminish the hard and difficult work of, of people who've been wrongfully convicted of their lawyers, um, of their families and their communities, there's a significant degree of chance. I mean, just one example is this. In order to uh, get the help of many innocence efforts, you, a, an accused, or I'm sorry, a convicted person has to be able to communicate 
their story. Yeah. And for some folks, you know, for here's a great example. So people who are um, deaf and disabled in prison may not not only not be able to write a letter, right. but they might not even be able to to get someone to write a letter for them. Yeah, a little bit further too, Kate. So as I started to to just set myself up in this law library, right? And I'm there because I needed to learn myself, but I'm also tutoring folks and, and, and stuff like that. And there's a difference between being able to read the words in front of you and being able to comprehend, you know, everything. And I realized that that a, a great, you know, majority of folks who are trying, you know, and have logical innocence claims, just think about that. It's hard to follow the legal terms. So how do we expect people to know the terms of the new advancements in science? Right. And they're faced with something like this. That's right. That's right. So let's, um, what I really want to especially focus on, and people should feel free to put questions in the Q&A if you have questions for us. Um, I've got a few already, but uh, you know, if you if you want to uh, send us some questions, we're happy to answer them. Um, but you know, Jared, one of the things that we've talked about before, you and I, and like at other events that we've done, is that you know what happened to you in prison is only and 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 with your you know involvement with the criminal justice system is only one part of your story. Yeah. And I do sort of see you know, and and you should uh, correct me if you don't feel the same way, but I do sort of see this moment that I'm going to ask you to read about. Um, from page 170 as the beginning of the next chapter of your story. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it is. And I don't, like, listen, it's not easy talking about, about what happened all the time. I'm like, you're literally talking about it all the time, about what happened. And I, I don't, I want people to understand that, that um, there is, there is trauma in each word, you know, of this story, of this, of this journey. Uh, I think back on how, like you just said, Kate, how easy it could have been for us to be buried in that place. Like my mandatory release would have been like 2020 or something like that, February, right? And I would have been, what? Turning 40, registering as a sex offender. Um, it just, it just, I, I just, I, you know, I, I shimmer just thinking about it, um, really do. But in this, this moment is, is you're right. This is when, uh, this is when the transformation from, you know, Jared, prison lawyer trying to get out to Jared getting ready to get out and needing to get himself uh, some, some, some help in order to go help other folks. That's really the best way I can sum this up. Yeah. So this is page 170. The guard leads me on, on the long walk to the phone. He hands me the receiver and backs away. I expect to hear silence as I wait to be passed into the call, but I pick up the phone and I hear laughter over a speakerphone. It's as if I've broken into someone's celebration, a private party. The voices speak happily over each other. And after a moment, I make out Keith's voice and Carl's and Andy's and I swallow and say, hey, it's Jared. Jared, Andy says, drawing my name out, almost as if he were singing or shouting at me across the room. Carl, Keith says, why don't you tell me? Wow, sure. Carl pauses. Jared, we got some good news. We won. You won the habeas appeal. I cannot speak. And that was the last word that I wrote about, about that. And I mean, I, I mean, it, it was, it was one of these things where I think that even, and I, I know um, I was talking to Carl about this. So Carl and Andy were the law students assigned to my case um, at the Innocence Project. And for, pe for people who are watching who don't know, so the Innocence Projects and organizations, they uh, are in large part supported and, and can only do what they do because of the students. And so uh, the students that I have at the end were Carl and were Andy, and they, uh, Carl and Andy check the website of the Seventh Circuit almost every day to see if my decision had been made. And, and uh, my decision was made uh, and they called and they told me about it. And so the, I remember, you know, there was an expectation for me to just, you know, be like hip, hip, hooray, but it was just, I wanted to see the bars and my rear view mirror getting smaller and smaller because it just, it wasn't gonna feel real until the end came. Yeah, yeah. 
but that kicked off a new life for you and yeah. and you went out of there with just this incredible drive to yeah. change the system so that it didn't happen to others um and i want to talk about a really significant accomplishment um that's both you know admirable but also yeah. poetic and so i yeah. think you know where i'm going i want to talk to you about richard baranek can yeah. you can you tell folks about your client yeah. richard baranek please so i um i come home i come home february 2007 uh, you know, I get the much needed help that I needed, mental health care, uh, family love, you know, and care, you know, and, and then I go on to get my associate's degree, bachelor's degree, law degree. I did a dual fellowship where I clerked in the Southern District of New York, as well as the Seventh Circuit, the same circuit that overturned my conviction. Then I went on to, to work at the Innocence Project with Barry Shack, Peter Newfield, and I uh, was assigned a case along with Bryce Benjack. And, and Bryce, uh, who's now at the Queens District Attorney's Office running the Conviction Integrity Unit, yep. a lot of, of, of how I'm able to practice now, what I'm looking for in cases, I learned it from Bryce. You know, I, I was with Bryce for a significant part of the time that I was there. I also worked with Vanessa, uh, Nina Morrison, and, and, you know, a few more attorneys who are, are are there, but I spent the bulk of my time in court with Bryce, and we were there for three cases, Kevin Bailey, Richard Baranek, and also Rodney Reed's case that's still being litigated right now. Yes. And so, um, you know, I just, I, I'm, it's like, it was an out-of-body experience to be home. Now it was, okay, well, I know I'm not the only one who went, who, who's went through this. So what is God trying to tell me, right? So I just started to go to school and continue to go to school. And just before you knew it, boom, I'm here. So then once I'm with the Innocence Project, we get assigned a Richard Baranda case. We make our way back to Wisconsin. Kate, 10 years to the month yeah. that I'm released. 10 years to the month. I'm released in February of 2007. February of 2017, I'm representing Richard Baranda along with Bryce Benjack. And co-counsel is none other than Keith Finley. You know, the guy who argued, you know, the reversal of my case in the Seventh Circuit. So it was, it was, is apropos the right word to say or, 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 or in this? Um, it's, boy, but, it's something, right? It's poetic. Yeah, I, it's, I mean, it, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's a wonderful story. It really is. And that story was about science, Kate. Yes. That's what that case was about. Yes. And would you say this kicked off your, your, your passion for making sure that um, for that there are organizations like the Center for Integrity and Forensic Sciences and making yeah. sure that fair evidence, fair scientific evidence is what's brought forth in courts. Not only fair, but it also, this case was the case that this is where I got, you know, my DNA bones, so to speak, yes. right? This was my, my uh, I think I said second, because Kevin Bailey was a DNA case too. Right. But this was the one where, you know, we had the results, we're down in the minutia, what is the mitochond what is mitochondrial dna and and you know and there used to be a time where we could only get dna from a hair if the pulp was included but now it's like boom the, the science is advanced how do you explain it how do you and again what i what i said before was key okay courts are learning judges are learning they're learning too and so that's why i realized how important it was to have organ an organization like sifs because you're talking about not just what's going on now, but the irreparable sometimes damage that was done as a result. And that's why this is so important. That Richard Baranek case taught me this. Investigators, FBI investigators, used as experts, were testifying to things that they had no right to. Yep. They were not well-founded. And studies and science has shown that they were horribly wrong. And in those cases, they're so spread out and we need to equip lawyers with as much knowledge so that way we can teach the courts as well as prosecutors need to learn. And so do the experts who were falsely testifying to this yeah. stuff. Yeah. Well, so for people who don't know, Richard Baranek was accused um, uh, with hair comparison microscopy. Yes. Um, which is, and feel free to jump in, but that's uh, a, a procedure that's not used very much anymore, 
where um, an analyst looks at the two hairs under a microscope and compares their features and then makes a, a statement about how likely they think that it is that, that the hairs are from the same person. Um, and it's problematic for this wide range of reasons, right? Um, but one thing that, that is a vein that goes through not only microscopic hair comparison analysis, but also all sorts of other forensic sciences is that experts consistently, almost every time they were in court, overstated yes. the accuracy of their conclusions and the value of the evidence. Um, and and I assume they did that in Richard's case too, right? Absolutely. And think about it. Like, not only did they do it, but I mean, they they did it to, to the point. Just think about this. You're in front of juries. The jury pool is impressionable. When you get an FBI agent testifying and saying, I've been with the FBI for you know, 30 some years and I've looked at thousands and thousands of hairs and this hair, when you compare it, it looks like juries are eating that up. Right. You know, so they're, 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 they're buying that. They're going with that. And then Richard's case, Richard's case was, first of all, it was an identification that was made months, you know, if not over a year. And I, and I, I don't recall exactly. It's not in front of me months though, after it was, it was an identification made with a photo. So that was suspect on its own, right? Um, there was uh, evidence of who we believe was a true perpetrator calling the victim's house and doing crank calls. That wasn't Richard Baranek either. And it was just, it was something so crazy that they would rely on, on this hair. And then what we found out through other litigation, and I believe that if I'm, if I'm stating this right, um, it was a memo that we were able to find through litigation that I believe that Peter Newfield and another group of attorneys were doing on other cases. And that's how, that's how we realized and came to find out that the FBI themselves had issued a memo saying, hey, look, guys, we were actually wrong. Stop testifying about this hair. And you would think that that would trigger, right? You think that that would trigger, uh, uh, a mass overhaul and a mass review of the cases before and the testimony before. And literally it has not. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's really significant, right? Because the what the lessons we learn from from wrongful convictions, especially those involving DNA exonerations, yeah. is that the, we can't trust the science, right? And so we should be going back, whenever we find one, we should be going back and looking at other similar cases. I mean, and the innocence efforts are of course trying to do that, but it is, you know, it's this long slog that we talked alone. about. You know, that, like we shouldn't be doing, the innocence world and the innocence network should not be doing the job of, of, of the cleanup. Um, you know, should we be assisting? Absolutely, right? Um, you know, but we shouldn't be doing this alone. It has to be, it, real criminal justice reform can only happen if everybody has an all hands on deck approach. Like that's, that's it. You know, real criminal justice reform starts with really doing it, right? Yep. And, and the way that you really do it is working hand in hand to go back and fix what you know was, that memo shouldn't have been a memo that was internal. That memo right. should have been an announcement to the entire criminal justice field. Yeah. Yeah, and I wanna talk a little bit about that, um, especially in the context of Richard's case. And then I have a question from James Didcock that's a very good question, so I'm excited yeah. to get to it. But um, but one thing I wanna ask is that, you know, we have, you had this case and there was new DNA testing done that, you yeah. know, technology that, that arose that you could now test the DNA and you found out it was somebody's DNA. And then surely, the prosecution let him out, right? No, and it's, it goes back again, Kate, to that thing about discretion, right? You know, and now the argument in the, in the shift the goalpost type of fashion, now the argument is, well, that's not the perpetrator's hair anymore. That was a hair that could have been, you know, in the washing machine or uh, floated on there from another item. But that's not the theory that was at trial. The theory was at trial was this hair was the hair left by the perpetrator. It was on the bed, you know, clothing, uh, bed, you know, uh, uh, sheets. 
and this was the perpetrators. On, on a post-conviction, when DNA adamantly, definitively shows that they were wrong, now all of a sudden, well, no, it's not the same hair. Well, maybe, maybe not the same hair. Maybe not the same person. Maybe we got that wrong, but we got everything else right. And that's, again, you know, I want people to understand that, that when prosecutors decide to fight cases as clear as this, they're doing it on your dime, our dime. That's what they're doing. And, it, and it's, it's a problem. Like, these, these cases take way too long. Richard, you know, Richard's case in the DNA was known for years, Kate. We literally were litigating what we knew for years. And we had to do it or, or, or Richard would still be sitting in there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it happens far too often, right? You get this incontrovertible, powerful evidence. And then instead of turning to remedying the wrong um as as we would do in in any other disaster which is exactly what these are right yeah. when we have you know plane crashes or horrible medical errors we don't fight about whether the plane crashed we look at the root causes and try to make it better because we know that this bad thing happened yeah and, and so I want to get to James's question because I think it's excellent and maybe we can discuss right. it a little bit. So he talked, and because this is really important. So he said, asks, while DNA evidence is key to providing relief for those wrongfully convicted, there are many cases of wrongful conviction that can't be given relief due to the lack of that DNA evidence. So how can or should innocence efforts, who, you know, who of course rely heavily on DNA evidence, um, try to move forward in seeking justice when there isn't that incontrovertible yeah. DNA evidence? So, I mean, it's a great question. And it's also yeah. what 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 we're doing. Like it, at my organization with Life After Justice, we are actually litigating cases that will lead to precedent, you know, setting things within our system. And we don't just focus on DNA. Um, and I think that right now what's going on is this. And I know this from my contacts, you know, my work and the conversations that I'm having. Innocence projects right now are now moving towards handling more cases that don't necessarily just have DNA as, as it's, you know, claim to innocence. Um, they, they, of course, you know, we focus on the science because the science teaches us and it, and it helps us with the, with the unrefutable uh, uh, argument um, sometimes in these cases, even though with Richard's case, it was still re re refuted, right? right? But I think that right now you're seeing organizations start to take on more and argue now um, false eyewitness or miss eyewitness identification is one thing, right? I think that uh, right now we're starting to evolve and start to investigate where multiple claims of wrongdoing by officers are now being looked at and deemed as new evidence for other people's cases to be revisited as well. And that, that's important as well because police misconduct, um, you know, lab misconduct, you know, most certainly should be considered as new evidence in these cases. And to the question, that was a great question because there are some folks who the evidence just isn't there anymore. You can't find it. Uh, I'm dealing with a case right now in New York where the evidence is just lost. It's unfortunate, Kate, but you know, like I know, laws of preserving evidence were not always on the books throughout the many different states. And in some states, they still don't have laws that preserve the evidence to be tested on appeal. So it's a struggle to answer that question, but the movement is starting to move into handling cases where you know and you can say to yourself, look, if, 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 if you have a conviction integrity unit, I want people to focus on integrity and what that means. You know sometimes from reviewing these cases, whether it may not be DNA evidence or, 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 or DNA testing or scientific evidence, you know when a case lacks integrity. You know when the representation, representation is so porous where you can see you know, what, was, what was done wrong in the case. Um, so the innocence networks, innocence movements are starting to move towards doing cases where there isn't a lot of DNA and evidence. And what's happening as a result is the cases of DNA, the cases of science that are supported, 
they're making it easier for the arguments of non-scientific based innocence cases, which we know there are a lot of. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think this is a, a neat thing to be able to talk about with you because this is part of why yeah. our two practices and our two organizations work well together and, and you know, have yeah. this unique partnership because, you know, as um, James alluded to in his question, you know, more than 95% of criminal cases do not involve any DNA evidence. Yes. Right. But what we can do and what our organizations do is take the lessons that we've learned from the cases that do have DNA evidence yeah. and then apply them broadly. Right. So let me give you an example by, of what I mean by that. If you um, have a case, um, as Jarrett did in his early in his practice with hair comparison microscopy, they were able to get DNA in their case that showed that the hair comparison was incorrect. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't make any other hair case any more correct. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. So now we can look at all of the hair cases and say whether or not there's DNA, we know this process is flawed. Yes. And people who get flawed process deserve new trials. Everyone Absolutely. should get a fair trial. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll use this analogy, right? So people, so hopefully people can understand what I'm saying. I want you to think about the busiest car wash you've ever been to. Just think about that for a second. So the car wash, man-made uh, machinery uh, that sees a lot of vehicles go through, you know, on a, on a rotating basis all the time, right? And sometimes, Kate, those those machines miss a window miss miss a bumper and when you get there at the end of the line you tell the attendant the usually the attendant right away is like you can go back through or we'll give you a ticket to come back at your own convenience um and you can go back through and get your car wash yeah. when it comes to wrongful convictions you go through this man-made process where people are rotating through with so many frequent numbers where, where, where things happen, where mistakes do legitimately happen sometimes, where, 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 where bad apples do happen as well, right. mistakes happen more often than the bad actors in these criminal justice cases and wrongful convictions. Right. So the difference between these two man-made things is this. With the car wash, people will, will get to a resolution like that. When it comes to wrongful convictions, you literally may not get back to the attendant for 10 years if you're lucky. And it's an issue. It's a problem. We can't care more about uh, the bumpers of our cars and the windows of our cars than we do about the lives. And I think that that it speaks volumes to, you know, just our acceptance of what science has taught us, what past cases have, has taught us. You would think that that would speed us up in terms of making decisions in these cases, but it just gets so bogged down with the litigation. And it's just, it's heartbreaking to think that no one has created a task force to go back and relitigate all of these hair analysis cases where the hair expert was the thing that pushed it over, right? They're not there for a reason, Kate. They're, they're not there just, just as decorations. They are used to, to be the nail, you know, in the coffin in these cases a lot of times. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to look forward a little bit in the time mm -hmm. that we have left, and I want to encourage people <laughs> to put questions in the chat if you have them, um, to, and we'll try to get to them in the time that we have left. Um, but, you know, wh what you have just said brings up this really important point, right, which is that right now what we're doing um, you know, before the, ad, the, the advent of SIFS and before your organization was formed, a big yeah. part of what we were doing, the way we were writing these wrongs, was fighting the cases one at a time. One at a time. Whether that's in post-conviction or whether that's, you know, once we've discovered the errors in the system, trying to litigate them on the front end at trial, yeah. but doing it one at a time. And I don't know about you, but that feels like banging my head against the wall. It's, it is. It's, you're spooning water out of the ocean. And that's yeah. why, this is why it's so important. And Kate, me and you had this conversation, you know, it's so important for us to always work with each other. Right. Because, because 
divide division is is conquering, right? Um, and so you're talking about a system where you you're up against you know a government or or you know a prosecuting body that has at its disposal all type of investigators and investigating bodies and stuff like that. That's why it's important for us in the innocence world and in the innocence network, all folks who are defenders. To, to, to share our synergy and energy with, with each other. Having conversations like this on a Sunday is important. Somebody might send us an email, Kate, and say, look, I want to help. You know, how do I get what you guys are doing and, 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 and put it out there publicly? We have a brief bank. We have an expert bank at SIPS. There are, there are tools, there are things that people can find. And I'll also say this, Kate, before I, before I go, because you had mentioned something that made me think about this. Even though there are cases where there's no DNA and stuff like that, there's not a case that doesn't involve some form of science. And science is the study, right, of things. So you think about it. We, we think about the study of eyewitness identification. We think about the study of trauma, um, explaining things to, to, to juries or how folks could get it wrong, right? We, we, we think about you know, the study of people in general. We think about mitigating factors and stuff like that. That's why I beg, beg to argue this. Science is in every fabric of the criminal justice system. Yeah. So if we want to change it, we need to listen to the science. Absolutely. Yeah, we've got another question. Um, we hear things like this all the time. Why are things not these things not considered a denial of fundamental fairness? And why are prosecutors so hellbent on conviction versus justice? Um, that's a great question. I yeah. I don't think that I, I'm just speaking for myself. I don't think that I have the answer, uh, yeah. the total answer, right. right? But I think that there's um, a real problem with the way the culture of prosecuting cases has been set up. Right. I think that the playing field is not level. And so when prosecutors have all the power, um, there's not a lot of motivation to change. And the truth is, I think probably quite a bit of the time, prosecutors get cases where they've identified the correct person, the perpetrator of the crime. People are caught in the act. People yeah. are, you know, reported by folks who know them well, um, yeah. all sorts of things. So they're getting it right enough of the time that they feel like they're right all of the time, I think is yeah. a huge part of it. I, I, I agree, but I, I also uh, will say this as well too. Um, you're also talking about a culture, right? And, and culture is, is important with, with, you know, the atmosphere inside of these offices, Kate. Right. You know, oftentimes I'm dealing with prosecutors who I can tell in their hearts of heart, they don't want to argue, make the arguments that they're making on paper and stuff like that, but they're doing it just because it's coming where? From the top, right? So I think that this is a cultural thing. This is a cultural Absolutely. shift that is happening right now in our society. And I think that we, what we have to understand is this, the criminal justice system is so huge. We have to take incremental steps. Just because it's not happening all at one time doesn't mean that we're not making progress and we are making progress with what we're doing. I think that what's important is for us to stay the course and more hands come on deck to help, you know, push this thing along. But I think, I think to answer that question, I think it starts with, with, with this. How do we go from prosecutors standing up and saying, put me in office because I got a 99.99 .99 conviction rate and I believe in lock them up and throw away the key. How do we go from that getting people almost always into office to Vote for me, because I'm about what's right. I'm about making sure that I protect the community while at the same time protect, you know, impoverished people who are taken advantage of by the criminal justice system. I will use my discretion to make sure that, that, that it's right. We don't vote for the latter guy as much as we vote for the first one. So I, that, if the answer to that question and, and the answer to that, that solution for that problem is how we get to, to a better criminal justice system. We have to literally invest in law schools, to invest in our students, to give them a well-rounded course of, of legal experience. So that way, when they don't go in, when they go into these offices, they don't go in jaded to just believing they know and have an experience that not all things are, are, are right outcomes. And sometimes, you know, as difficult as it is, you just got to do what is right, Kate. Okay. 
That's right. I completely agree. Yeah. And I think specifically as it relates to forensic science, you know, we've seen prosecutors organizations like the National District Attorneys Association when faced with this just objective scientific evidence that yes. certain techniques and processes are are unjust, are wrong far too much of the time. Yeah. They've been so unwilling to abandon these tools that they've gotten used to using. And mm -hmm. when a tool doesn't work, we have to discard it. Absolutely. You can't just keep using the old busted tool. Yeah, yeah I mean, you're absolutely right. You know, all, all I act, what I, what we, I think I speak for the innocence world when I say this. In the innocence network, innocence world, all those uh, supporters as well. Um, we saw, a ridiculous amount of money spent on uh, the war on drugs, and it re resulted in uh, mass incarceration. We just want to see a fraction of that money spent on the systematical things that we know need change. The 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 allowing um, science to lead us to a better criminal justice system in our society, uh, using experts to explain the trauma that is in these communities because these communities aren't dealing with post-traumatic anything. It's persistent traumatic stress. Persistent traumatic stress creates, you know, the over-incarceration and, and uh, allowing the people to look at a certain group of people and say, oh, well, they probably deserve it or anything like that. I, I just want to see what's fair, Kate. And I don't think that we're asking for, for, for too much for, for the, the playing field to be leveled. I don't think we're asking for too much. I don't think we're asking too much by requesting and requiring a prosecutor's office, a FBI organization, a, a, a whoever it is to, to take the lead on fixing the mistakes that science has told us we made. We've just gotten this incredible uh, layup in the chat. Thank you, yeah. Bakar Shabazz. Uh, that says even the guilty deserve justice. And that's exactly right. That's a huge part of our mission here at the Center for Integrity and Forensic Sciences. We are not exclusively an innocence organization yeah. because everyone deserves a fair trial. Even if you seem really guilty at the outset of your case, right. you still deserve to have nobody lie during your trial. Nobody yeah. hide evidence from you. Nobody use techniques that are now known to be wrong to prosecute you. Also this, Kate. There's the study, there's this, there, here's science again. So science is so important in cases where there is guilt because it explains who the person is. It explains, you know, why a crime was committed. It explains how locking people up for decades at a time doesn't make us safer. It explains how the investment of people who are incarcerated needs to be on repairing people and not warehousing them. So trust me, great question, great point. And I hope we didn't come across as if we're just focused on the, the, the innocent science, right. because that's not. We're focused on the science making us a better society. Exactly. I can't have said, couldn't have said it better myself, my friend. I'm, I'm so grateful to you for yeah. not only joining us today, but also serving on our board and helping um, lead our organization into the right, in the right direction and into the yeah. future. So thank you so so, so much. No, I thank um, you for the opportunity. I really do. I, I uh, you know, um, there aren't many exoneree-led, um, attorney-driven, you know, wrongful conviction battling, um, you know, people like myself. So I pray that what I'm able to do and in, 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 in how you guys are, are, are supporting me and partnering with me, I pray that it's inspiration for more to join the cause um, as well. Because diversity, equality is how we get to a better society, a better criminal justice system. And we need to allow scientists and research to lead the charge in that. That's exactly right, yeah. So I wanna encourage folks who are interested to, um, to learn more about the work of the Center for Integrity and Forensic Sciences and also the work of Jarrett's organization, Life After Justice. Um, please follow us on social media um, and feel free to follow our YouTube channel. This, um, this, oops, this talk will be posted on YouTube and you'll be able to take a look at it and share it with others. Um, so I encourage you to do that and, and you know, learn more about this struggle. Right. Thank you so much, Jarrett.
Thank you. Thank you for having me. I look forward to doing this again. Um, and and I look, I look, listen, I as science, talking about science again. Yep. As science leads us into this new year, I pray that everyone goes into this new year happy, healthy, and safe. Um, and I look forward to doing this again soon. Okay. Thank you so much, Jarrett. And right. thank you to everyone. Have a great rest of your Sunday.